Hey there! I'm so excited to show you this build. My partner and I went to Japan last year, and it was absolutely amazing. The food, the architecture, the transit, the cleanliness, it was such a dream. So, of course, as soon as we got back, I missed it. And like I said with my Diagon Alley nook, if you can't go to the place, bring the place to you. So here we go! Like all nooks, it started out with the world's most vague plan and cardboard. It's generally paperback sized and will have six different shops, so let's cut those out of cardboard too. It took me a while to find my glue gun and glue sticks. I realized that I don't really use my glue gun that much. Am I even fit to call myself a crafter if I don't know where my glue gun is? Instead of being a rectangle, I made the nook more of a long trapezoid. The books won't lay flat against the sides, but it's much easier to see more of the storefronts. This was such a project of problems, and this is the first one. The floor. I was originally going to make my typical foam street with carved designs like the two Harry Potter nooks, but this ended up being a bad choice. You'll see later. Moving on to something a little happier, I tried new materials in this build. This one was too good to pass up. It was the perfect wavy pattern for both a rolling steel door cover thing and the beautiful roof tiles. I didn't know how much I was going to need for the roofs, so I used the sheet as a mold for the clay door. I painted it dark silver and set it aside for later. Time for the first door! I have a confession to make. I love doors. There are so many beautiful doors in the world. I even have a favorite door in New York that I pass a lot. And the doors in Japan are lovely. I used a few different reference shots and created a couple designs. The first two I made with polystyrene sheet and basswood super glued together, but I did things a little differently for the last door. I wanted to fake a sliding door style, so I needed much thinner strips to keep it sleek. Luckily, we'd gotten some new socks recently, and there was a wonderful thick cardboard as part of the packaging. I cut strips from that and super glued the strips on. Yes, this would be a pretty narrow door to get through in reality. Yes, I should actually learn to measure things properly. No, I will probably not learn my lesson. I gave the wood a fake stain with watered down acrylics and painted the sliding door brown. The walls now. I tried painting cardboard directly before, and I've had problems with it warping under the moisture. So this time I thought maybe I could do a smart and paper mache the walls. I used the watered down Elmer's glue and extra napkins from food deliveries. I always say I don't need utensils, but I still get a tower of napkins every time. It's good though, free craft supplies. Unlike the fake slate I made with the napkins before, I put them on flat this time, just for structural stability. When it was all dry, I realized the problem, part two. Remember how I said that the cardboard warped under the moisture of the paint? Yeah, I forgot that wet glue would do the same thing as wet paint. Luckily, it was still flexy enough that I could hot glue it to the wall and make it flatter again. After struggling with the walls and doors, I decided to pivot to the crates. I wanted to have a couple crates on the street, like the ones that have bottles of beer in them. 
I always see other crafters cut this material so smoothly and everything comes together at perfect right angles and the finished product looks so incredibly realistic and I am not having that experience. For some reason, no matter how much I measure, and even if I use my ruler for a straight edge, nothing is perfect. But I have a solution to this problem ready to go. I have a whole set of files from when I used to make jewelry, and there's a perfect one that eats through the sheet like it's nothing. After super gluing the box together and unsuper gluing my fingers, I filed off all the uneven edges and gave it a sanding to prep for paint. So I had this idea that at the back of the nook would be a mirror. I've seen a lot of artists do this, and it's always so cool. However, I will remind you that I'm a little bit of a crazy person. I wanted the reflection to be different enough from the actual alley that it kind of tricks the eye. Wouldn't it be cool if the crates looked different in the reflection? Yes. Therefore, let's get tricky painting. I picked the angle I wanted for the crates, where you can see two sides. These two sides are going to be red. The other two sides will be blue for the reflection. Ta-da! I have two red crates. Or do I have two blue crates? I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do about the storefronts yet, so I productively procrastinated by tackling the stools. I had painted one storefront, the ramen place. If you saw my mini foods video, you've actually seen the counter where all the ramen will sit. So now it's time to make the place where people will sit. I started off by making the seat cushions from my favorite Super Sculpey firm. I used my circle template to cut out a few thick patties and I rounded the edges. Using one of my silicone tools, I tried to make the little fold lines around the edge, like the vinyl was being pulled around foam, and I added a little snake around the edge for piping. Piping is key to a nicely finished edge. I knew I'd never be able to make Sculpey legs that were perfectly straight and very strong, so I grabbed some disposable chopsticks and I cut those to size. I guess I should be glad that restaurants send so many utensils and napkins. The bases were just two more patties on top of each other and smoothed out. When everything was baked, it was super glue time! And paint. I based it in black and dry brushed the base with dark silver so you could still see the black in places. It looks so much more realistic this way instead of just plain silver. I painted the cushion red and dry brushed some lighter red to distress it. After all, lots of people have been to this ramen shop. I hear it's really tasty. While I was working on the crates and stools, I finally decided how I wanted to paint the storefronts. Most of the stores are going to be an off-white sort of plasterish with whiter dry brushing, and one of them will be dark brown like wood. Just keeping it simple instead of using even more time agonizing over what the actual material would have been. One of the key things you notice when you see a picture of one of these alleys is how visually busy it is. I'm going to be making a few greebles to help with that feeling. I don't really know if this qualifies as a greeble. Where does Greeble end and thing begin? Anyway, it's going to be an air duct thing in the ramen shop. I made it out of 3mm foam, but when I placed it in the nook, it was way too squishy and it didn't really hold the sharp edges. Yuck. So say hello to the recycled shopping bag Pepakura version! I wanted this to be more of a galvanized steel look, so I dabbed on some Mod Podge with a paper towel to get a bit of texture, then I dry brushed the dark silver onto it. 
It mimics the more uneven coloring really well. I was ready to start on the awnings, and I did a smart. I planned the holes so I would be able to get the lights in later. I stuck everything together with hot glue and expanded the light working space. Have you noticed the next project problem? I haven't yet. I managed to get the wavy plastic, measure, cut out enough for the roof tiles before I figured it out. Once that problem was solved, I hot glued layers of the wavy plastic and based it in black. To make it look like the pretty overlapping tiles, I did a highlight on one side of the top ridges and some shadows on the opposite side of the bottom wave. I made another roof like this for another shop, and I made a little triangular overhang with sock cardstock and basswood, which I super glued together. There are also tons of AC units on the outside of buildings, and I knew I wanted to make a few. The box was pretty easy, but the fan cover was a bit trickier. I do like the way it turned out, but I really didn't want to do another one by hand. Did you think the problems were over? Nope. The first time I poured this two-part silicone, the AC came unstuck from the bottom and floated to the top. The second time, bubbles. I was running out of the pourable silicone, so I tried building up a mold using the putty. The putty really isn't great for this sort of thing because it tends to distort around the edges, but I thought that if I built it up in several different pieces, I could get cleaner edges. Not the best, but good enough. I can always sand and clean up the casting. The second AC is definitely not perfect, so it's going to be in the back of the nook. I painted them both off-white with little blue brand labels and used a dark brown wash to give it some depth and grime. I knew this project was going to be big, so I made the food in advance. Check out that video if you want to see me making tiny individual panko crumbs. Time for more super glue! The fake food window is going to be in the shop closest to the opening so that we can really appreciate the foods up close and personal. I even made sure to leave a little gap so that I can feed the lights in later. Japan has the coolest fake foods. We went to a store where they were selling fake foods and they were so amazing. It's wonderful to me that people get to do that for a living. Maybe I would do something like that if I lived in Japan. At this point, I had to tackle the floor. I wanted it to be a little fancy this time and do a concrete texture. I glued some strips of cardstock curving into the back to add as sidewalk edges. Do you see where I made another project problem? A little hint, I'd forgotten about the mirror. 
I was feeling brave and experimental, so I grabbed the sand from my Subnautica diorama and mixed it with Elmer's glue, water, and black and white paint. Mmm, soup. I had a bit of a hard time spreading it, but I thought it wouldn't be too bad. I could always fill any gaps after it dried. After a lot of refining and painting, I didn't love it. But I really didn't love it when I realized that having the mirror perpendicular to the back meant that the gentle curve of the road turned into a hard, sharp turn. Add this to the displeasure of the warped walls and the realization that an angled back would have been better for the mirror, and I really had no choice but to recut the entire box from scratch. Which actually turned out to be amazing! For the floor this time, I cut the piece of cardboard and a piece of 2mm foam that would go around the shops. I had noticed the bottom of the shops were still a little warped, so the foam would help disguise that. I still wanted to use the sand texture, but I did it a little differently this time. I painted the foam with the glue mixture and then sprinkled sand over it to avoid all the unevenness from before. Then, once it was dry, I went over it again with the glue mixture to make sure the texture was more subtle and dry brush some grays, light browns, and we have a serviceable street. My favorite box to work with used to be the nuts.com box, not sponsored, but a new contender has taken its place. Meet the Alberts box, also not sponsored. It's really thin, really light, super strong, and cuts like butter. I loved how sturdy the nuts.com box was, but the strength came at the cost of thickness. I didn't have enough of the shoe box to make the whole nook, but I did get both walls. For this part, it's time to make the signs! I made little boxes out of the polystyrene sheet, and I tested fairy lights inside them. I didn't want to use real shop names, or make-up names, so I'm just using food words. Mostly food words, anyway. First, I drew things in pencil, then I went over it with my colored sharpies. However, I encountered another project problem. Some of the inks never dried, so I ended up painting over the pencil line instead. Also, I know I'm not doing the proper stroke orders. I'm so sorry. It's just hard and I didn't have time to learn how to do it properly and beautifully. Please forgive me! The hardest one was definitely the lantern. I couldn't do this out of the sheet plastic, so after a little experimentation, I found that painting parchment paper could work. It was still thin enough to let light through, and I could bend it around these two cardboard circles and super glue it in place. For the recessed door in the back, I wanted to make the pretty Noren curtains you see sometimes in front of restaurants and stores. I don't have any fabric dyes, but I thought that this ink would do the trick. I completely saturated it and let it sit for a long time. Then I wrung it out and blasted it with my heat gun to dry it. I used the chopstick from earlier to make a curtain rod and painted the word sushi on the curtain. To attach it to the curtain rod, I cut tiny strips of fabric and super glued them around the chopstick to the fabric before cutting it up the middle. Then I super glued the whole rod above the door. We're in the home stretch! I added all the signs to the walls, remembering to put holes so the lights can be fed through, but when I went to test out the mirror, I just realized that when you look in the mirror, it's backwards. They're backwards. I have to redo them. Project problems. So I spent 15 minutes wandering around making aggravated noises before scraping off the backs and figuring out how to paint the characters backwards. And that lantern I spent so long figuring out, I couldn't get the paint off without destroying it, so I had to remake the whole thing. Which actually turned out a little better. 
Instead of the cardboard skeleton, I made clay half spheres and super glued a dowel in between them. Not pictured here is me remembering to add a hole for the light and then gluing the paper on upside down so the hole was at the bottom. And I drilled a new hole. Time to place the rest of the tiny foods. Let's get the ramen counter set up. I really love ramen. I'm back to daydreaming about having ramen again. And gyoza, of course. As a final touch, I wanted to add something that could only be seen in the reflection, and the back corner by the sushi restaurant was the best place for it. I made a tiny bonsai. Let there be light. I popped one of the lights in the lantern as a test, and it's so cute! I wove the strings of fairy lights from one hole to the other, taping it in place where it needed to so I didn't constantly yank it out of the holes. This was such a project. Now that it's over, the problems don't seem so bad, but wow, it was a lot. If you've made it to the end, I'd love to know what location you'd keep on your bookshelf. Leave me a comment, it would be so cool to hear. Also, I went through three tubes of super glue, so it is time to order some more. If you'd like to contribute to my super glue fund, I do have a link in the description. Thank you again so much for watching, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.